بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد أثر نمبر 134 حدثنا أبو خيثمة قال حدثنا محمد بن عبد الله قال حدثنا ابن عون قال كان القاسم بن محمد وابن سينين ورجاء بن حيوة يحدثون الحديث على حروفه وكان الحسن وإبراهيم والشعبي يحدثون بالمعاني Athar number 134 is related from Muhammad ibn Abdullah who reported from Abdullah ibn Aoun who, who said that the following tabi'een, the following salaf they used to report the hadith word for word there was never no general meaning but it would be word for word and those were Qasim ibn Muhammad, Muhammad ibn Sinin, and Raja ibn Haywa. They used to narrate the hadith exactly as they heard it. And as far as the others, such as Hassan Basri, Ibrahim Nakhai, and Shabi, the names to give the wording of the the meaning of the hadith in general. The purpose of this athar and the meaning of this athar is how the Salaf al-Salih how they differed on the various styles of reporting ilm and of reporting hadiths. And when you study the books of Al-Mustalah, you're going to come across the chapter or the section of Riwayat al-Hadith bil Ma'na. Is it permissible, is it lawful to narrate a hadith uh, with the general meaning and not necessarily verbatim or word for word, so on and so forth. And the scholars and how they differ on that and the different views and different madhabs regarding that. And it goes to show you how the Salaf al-Salih, radiallahu anhum, they differ on many things with regards to the styles and the techniques and the methods and modes of ilm, learning it, studying it, passing it on, so on and so forth. And we know in brief, because this is not the, the place of this discussion, it's permissible to summarize the hadith, it's permissible to dissect the hadith, take a part of it, it's permissible to mention the hadith with general wording, it doesn't always have to be... Uh, uh, the exact specific wording with the condition is that a person knows what he's doing and with the condition is that a person does not distort and taint the sound and valid meaning and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best moving forward hadathana Abu Khaythama qal hadathana Muhammad ibn Abdul Ansari qal hadathana ibn Aoun qal dakhaltu ala Ibrahima fa dakhala alayna Hamad فجعل يسأله ومعه أطراف قال فقال ما هذا قال إن معه أطراف قال ألم أنهى عن هذا The next narration uh, is reported from Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Ansari who also narrates from Abdullah ibn Aoun who says I entered upon Ibrahim al nakhai and um, when I entered upon him Afterwards, another man came, and he was Hamad, meaning Hamad ibn Abi Suleiman, the famous Kufi, the famous Faqih. Tayyib. Uh, so, he began to ask uh, Ibrahim Naqai certain questions. And obviously, there's history with regards to Hamad ibn Abi Suleiman, Ibrahim Naqai, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and the madhab of Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, and the uh, founding, or the, the the founding and the establishment of his madhab, uh, and his line, and his his pedigree, his background, of where he took his fiqh from, etc. Tayyib. So he began to ask Ibrahim al Nakhai, and he had with him atraf, a plural of taraf, and that could mean books or papers, in which parts of hadiths were written down, or it could mean something else. What's important is he began asking him questions, and Ibrahim al Nakhai says, What is this? What is this? Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman says, It's nothing more than the atraf. And he says, Have I not forbidden you from doing this? And perhaps the meaning from this is writing down knowledge and putting knowledge into paper instead of actual memorization, like we have explained before. Tayyib, Athar number 136. Goes on and explains the opposite. It says, "An Jadirin, an Mansurin, an Ibrahima, qala la baasa bi kitab al-atraf." 
the next narration shows the exact opposite. And that is that Ibrahim al Nakhai, Rahimahullah, Athar 137 or 136, excuse me, from, uh, he mentions his Isnad here, that's not in full version. He says, La ba'sa bi kitab al atraf. There's nothing wrong with writing down the atraf. Shaykh al Bani, Rahimahullah, in the footnotes, he says here, وَالْمُرَادُ بِالْأَطْرَافِ وَاللَّهُ عَلَمْ أَوَائِلُ الْأَحَدِيثِ كَانُوا يَكْتُبُونَهَا يَتَذَكِّرُونَ الْأَحَدِيثَ بِهَا He says the Muslim by Atraf is the beginning of the hadiths. Like I just explained to you. Shaykh Bani Rahim Allah says, and they, they, the Salaf, some of them would write that in the beginning of the hadiths and will remind them of the rest. In other words, summarize notes. All I have to do is write that in the beginning of the sentence and I got the rest. Clear, inshallah, like index cards, like we use index cards, methylin. Moving forward. Athar 137, Hadathan Abu Khaytama, Hadathan Imran, Imran, The next narration is from Mu'adh, from Imran. From Abu Mijlis, from Bashir ibn Nuhayk, or Bushair ibn Nuhayk, different, uh, dubbed. He says that I used to write hadiths from Abu Huraira. And when I wanted to leave him, meaning I wanted to go back to my land or my village, I was, I was done studying under him. I went to him with those notes that I took down. And I asked Abu Huraira, I said to him, this is what I've heard from you. Abu Huraira said, yes. This means... As if Abu Hurairah anhu gave him the ijazah. The concept of riwayat al-hadith min al-kitab. Taking the knowledge that's written down. And passing it on from the shaykh. If it's not memorized in the chest. But you have it written down. And the shaykh giving you the ijazah. And the different types of ijazah. Al-munawala. Al-mukatabah. The different types of riwayat. Al-munawala. Al-mukataba, Al-wasiya. Al-wijada. Okay. And the... Uh, Taking the book along with ijazah, ijazah without the book, etc. These things that have been explained in Nukhbat al Fikr and at Tadkira. With regards to how to successfully and correctly and valid, how to make a valid narration of hadith through paper. Okay, we've explained all of those things. Moving forward. He says, Hadathna Abu Khaythima, Qala Hadathna Mu'adh, Qala Hadathna Ash'ath, and in Hassan, Qala, Qala Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Mina Sadaqati. أن يعلم الرجل العلم فيعمل به ويعلمه قال الأشعث ألا ترى أنه بدأ بالعلم قبل العمل Narration 138 uh, The author says here that it's reported by Mu'adh who narrated from Ash'ath who narrated from Al-Hasan who said that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it is an act of charity for a man to teach knowledge, and then a man acts upon it and teaches it to others. Al Ash'ath, he said, Don't you see that he began with knowledge before action? This Athar here, this narration, of course, um, is not necessarily the most authentic, whereas it is clearly Mursal. Hassan al Basri did not hear meet the Prophet. And it's not mentioned who's between Hassan and the Prophet. Was it a companion or someone other than a companion? And with the Ulama Islam, the scholars of hadith say regarding the murasil of Hassan al-Basri and the different details of, of Mursal reports. What's important is, is the meaning is valid, the importance of teaching knowledge, giving sadaqah, passing on knowledge to others, not allowing the knowledge to die, and also the importance of a person beginning with knowledge before action. Starting with knowledge before action. And this thought here in Imam... Uh, Abu Khaythima being yani, so early on, dying in the 3rd century, it's a proof for Ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah in his book, Asul al Thalatha, about al ilm qabl al khawri wal amal. Knowledge precedes speech and action. Even though Ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah quoted the Quran to prove that point, and he also quoted Al Bukhari to prove that point. So it's sufficient just it being in the Quran. That's more than enough proof. And it's enough proof that it's common sense. And Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, is more famous, more well-known, more renowned to have mentioned that in his Sahih, al-ilmu qabil al-qawidim al-amal. 
But when we have another proof, we have uh, another uh, means of citing a reference scholar that came so long ago before Ibn Abdul Wahab, it just solid, uh, solidifies the point even further. It makes it even more concrete. So it's not just an Ibn Abdul Wahab thing. It's not just a Wahhabi thing. You have to learn before you act. Know before you move. Think before you move. Khairan, inshallah. Moving forward. Hadathana Abu Khaythama. قال حدثنا إسماعيل بن إبراهيم عن أيوب قال سمعت القاسم ابن محمد يقول إنكم تسألون عما لا نعلم والله لو علمناه ما كتمناه ولا استحللنا كتمانه Narration 139 is reported from Ismail ibn Ibrahim from Ayyub who said that I heard Qasim ibn Muhammad saying you people and Qasim Muhammad obviously is from the major fuqaha of Medina uh, he said that you people, you come and you ask us about things about which we don't know. And he, Qasim says, Wallahi, if we knew the answers, we would give them to you. We would not hide it. And Wallahi, we do not deem it to be permissible to hide knowledge. Allahu Akbar. As we've explained in the beginning of the book, the middle of the book, other books, countless lectures, breaking the backs of those people who wish to hinder the people from Allah's path, hide knowledge, Keep the people ignorant, keep the people astray. They wish to divide and split and separate and not unify and not join the people. They quote this Imam, Imam Ahmed, this, Hassan al Basri said this, Fulan ran away, Kada, Fulan was scared to answer the question, Kada. So therefore, you don't speak, you don't talk, you shouldn't have a YouTube page, you shouldn't give a class unless Brother Fulan allows you or unless Brother Fulan gives you permission and so on and so forth. Unless you join our gang, our clique of thugs. Okay, then you can talk and teach. And if you're not our friend or our flunky or associate or affiliate, then you can't teach. And you're opposing the salaf and you're coming before the scholars and so on and so on and so on and so forth. This athar breaks their backs. He clearly states that if we knew, we would answer. And the only thing that prevented them from answering is that they didn't know. So if a talib or an more scholar does know the answer, then they are to teach and they are to explain and they are to give the information to the people. And he clearly says, We don't hold it to be halal to hinder knowledge and to hold, to hold knowledge to hinder men from Allah's path. Moving forward. Hadathana Abu Khaythama, Qad Hadathana Jaleel, Al Nayth, Al Mujahid, Al Ibn Abbasin, Ahsabu, Ahsibuhu, or Ahsabuhu, Rafahu, Ila Nabi Sayyid Salaman, who call Menhu Mani, La Yakdi, Wahidun, Minhuma, Nahmatahu. من هم في طلب العلم لا يقضي نهمته ومن هم في طلب الدنيا لا لا يقضي نهمته. أثر 141 is reported from Jarir, from Leith, from Mujahid, from Abdullah bin Abbas, who says that uh, a Mujahid narrates from Ibn Abbas. He says, I believe that he narrated from the Prophet that he said, there are two people who have a taste. Two people who have a lust, two people who have a desire, and they'll never fulfill their lust and their satisfaction and their desire. They'll never ever get enough. And these two people are those who lust for knowledge and those who lust the dunya. And we've explained that many times before in the narration of Anas and the 40 hadiths on seeking knowledge. Wallahu alam. Athar 142, hadathna Abu Khaythama, qala hadathna Jaleel, an Layth, an Ata, qala qala Abu Hurairah. من كاتب علم من ينتفع به أو ينتفع به الجما بلجام من نار. The narration 142 is from Jarir from Layth from Ata who said that Abu Huraira said, whoever hides knowledge, which is beneficial knowledge, on the day of judgment he will have a bridle of fire around his neck. وَالْيَأْذُ بِاللَّهِ Sheikh Labain رحمه الله says in the footnotes at منقوف ضعيف الإسناد. وقد صح مرفوعا من طرق عن عطاء عن أبي هريرة مرفوعة وصح وتلميذي وابن حبان والحاكم الذهبي وانظر تحذير الساجد صفحة أربعة. He says that the chain of this narration is weak and it's منقوف it's not مرفوع and there are other versions of this narration which are مرفوع uh, that have been mentioned in other places and this is also included in the 40 hadith on seeking knowledge about the severe sin the gravity the gravity of the crime of hindering people from learning that which is they that which is beneficial, that which they need. Moving forward. 
حدثنا أبو خيثم قال حدثنا جرير عن ليث عن يحيى عن علي قال على أقبركم بالفقيه حق الفقه الذي لا يقنط الناس من رحمة الله ولا يرخص للمرء في معاصي الله ولا يدع القرآن رغبة إلى غيره إنه لا خير في عبادة لا علم فيها ولا خير في علم لا فقه فيه ولا خير في قراءة لا تدبر معها The next narration is from uh, narration 143. It's reported by Jarir from Layf, from Yahya, from Ali, who said, Shall I not tell you of who the true faqih is? The true jurist. The true learned person. He is the person who does not push the people into despair from Allah's mercy. He is the one who does not allow them and give them concessions to disobey Allah. Give them fatawa which caused them to fall into disobeying Allah. He is not the one who abandons the Quran to stay busy with something else. There is no good in worship in which there is no knowledge. There is no good in knowledge in which there is no understanding. And there is no good in reading in which there is no pondering and reflection. Allahu Akbar. What a tremendous narration. What a most beautiful and exquisite narration. The true scholar, the true learned person is not the person who's of a race or an age or a gender, not the person who graduated from Medina or graduated from Azhar or sat with this sheikh or Sheikh Fulan knows him or Brother Fulan knows him and he's friends with Brother Fulan and Sheikh Fulan mentioned him. That's not, that's not the mark of the true scholar. What madhab you study, what madhab you're on, the mark of the true faqih is the one who looks into the depths, is the one who does not push the people from hoping for Allah's mercy. Ya yeah, Sheikh, I made this sin, you're doomed to hell. Yes, yeah, Sheikh, I come from this country, you're doomed to hell. Yes, yeah, Sheikh, I study, you're doomed to hell. You're a deviant, you're an innovator. Get out of here. You're astray. You have to do this. You have to follow in. You have to, you have to, you have to, you have to. There's no way. There's no hope. He doesn't doom the people. He doesn't push the people from Allah's Rahmah. Rather, he brings them close. He doesn't split and divide. He unifies the people. He educates the people. He teaches the people. And he wishes or he makes the people have the taste and the thirst and the greed for Allah's mercy. Natma'u, as is mentioned in the Qur'an, we have the tama. He gets the people to want it. He inspires them, he encourages them to follow the sunnah, to learn ilm, to follow the deen. And not the opposite. And for those who say, where there are many inspirational speakers, there are many people who talk and they talk about this merciful thing and this beautiful thing and this pious thing and that's all they talk about. He mentioned the opposite as well. And that is... لا يرخص للمرء في معاصي الله. He does not twist and bend the fatawa to get the people to disobey Allah, making the haram halal. He doesn't foolishly give rulings. He doesn't foolishly speak on things and talk about things and get people to stand on the cliff in the edge of something dangerous. Look at the times in which we live. This mufti, this qadi, this doctor, this da'i. It's okay. It's halal. Allah knows what's in your heart. لا إكراه في الدين لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا يريد الله بكم أن يصلي all the verses that people quote to disobey Allah to break the rules that is not the way of this faqih that's not what he does he then says and as far as worship that's baseless of ilm is no is void of ilm there's no ilm in it then there's no good in it talking about the different groups whether they call themselves Sufi or whatever they call themselves in which they just worship and they don't study they don't teach they don't give the people knowledge. There's no good in that ibad that he says. If it's based off of ignorance. And if you have a great amount of knowledge, you memorize, you study, what good of it if you don't have fiqh? If you don't understand? If you don't have depth? If you're just on the surface, Sheikh Fulan says, that's it. Ah, oh, Sheikh Fulan said it's okay. That Why did he say it? How did he say it? What's the proof for him saying it? How does that apply to Canada in 2020? How does that apply to the Northeast sector of the United States in 2020? How does that apply to the British Muslims in 2020? You have no fiqh, no fahm, no understanding. What good is your knowledge? Tayyib, last but not least, or before that, he also mentioned about the true faqih. He says, He doesn't deal and stick with and stick to something besides the Qur'an, other than the Qur'an. His starting point is the Qur'an, his ending point is the Qur'an, the legislation, the constitution, aqidah, adab, akhlaq, kulluhu, it starts off with the Qur'an. And that's the greatest focus that we have to pay to, and attention is to the Qur'an. It's memorization, proper, properly reading it, 
It's tafsir, it's meaning, and reflecting to dabur. That's the true scholar, the true knowledgeable person. Last but not least, he mentioned about reading something without reflecting on it. There's no good in it. Information. People who, oh, I've read this book, I have this ijazah, sheikh, for that. Well, okay, then what? What are you reading? Do you understand it? Do you have any comprehension of it? Or you just have a bunch of sound bites? Moving forward. Athar 144. حدثنا أبو خيثمة قرأ حدثنا جرير عن ليث عن مجاهد عن ابن عمر قال يا أيها الناس لا تسألوا عما لم يكن فإن أو فإن عمر كان يلعن أو يسب من يسأل عما لم يكن 144 is narrated from جرير from ليث from مجاهد from ابن عمر who said O oh people don't ask about things that have not yet taken place and that's because Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu used to curse or he used to revile and speak down upon those who asked about things that have not yet happened. Those who have asked or who ask about things that have not yet happened. Uh, this athar being the most authentic from Umar, not necessarily. However, it's mentioned uh, with regards to asking about these faradiyat, ara'ayta, what happens, have you not seen, what do you think. We explained this in the book before. And the position of the Salaf with regards to that. And the balanced view with regards to that. Tayyip. Ather number 145. Hadathana Abu Khaythama. Hadathana 145 is from Hushayim, from Ismail ibn Salim, from Habib ibn Abi Thabit, who said, when a person is teaching the people, and he's giving the people knowledge, he's teaching them hadiths, then the sunnah is for him to look at them and speak to them all collectively, to address them collectively, and not to speak to one person without the rest of the crowd. This shows us a finely tuned adab, finely tuned etiquette, finely tuned piece of manners, with regards to a tahdith, teaching, giving hadith, is don't make the people feel that one person is more special than the others. Give all of them the knowledge, teach all of them the knowledge, and look at all of them. This I thought also goes to show us the importance of seeing a person's face and looking at a person while you listen to a person. And of course, this book was written over a thousand years ago. This ethar also uh, or goes to show us the concept of the importance of television. And the importance of videos. And the importance of media and social media. And how when you speak to someone, them looking at you, looking at your face and hearing you, isn't the same as, just, as, this, uh, as them just hearing you. And there is a more profound uh, effect and impact. And that is a means of love and respect and making the people feel closer to you and loved by you. And there's wisdom in that. Wallahu alam. 146. قال سمعت الشعبية يقول أو سمعت الشعبية يقول إذا سمعت شيء فكتبه ولو في الحائط. <clears throat> One forty six is narrated from Wakir, from Abu Kairan, who says that Shabi he said I heard him saying, when you hear anything then write it down. Whenever you come across something write it down, even if you gotta write it on the wall. Even if you have to write it on the wall that's what you should do. This ethar clearly proves uh, those who hold the argument that knowledge is permissible to be written down and knowledge should be written down. And that it is not haram and it is not disliked to write down knowledge as we've explained many times before in this book and in other places. Uh, another faida, a new faida, is that this, this ethar shows us uh, and it proves the principle of resilience. Is that if you're a student of knowledge, you have to be resilient. And you have to be hungry. You got to want it. You got to desire it. You can't make a weak, lame excuse. I lost my book. Okay, write it on your hand. Uh, I couldn't go. My mother, my parents, this, fulan, fulan, blah, blah. Stop making excuses. Go overseas. Bismillah. Do it. Do or do not. There is no try. You hear something beneficial, get it. Write it down. Don't depend on your memory. Your memory will fail you when you need it. Al-Hifdu Khawan, be resilient, be hungry, be rough and tough. Take a thirst towards ilm before it's too late. Now, this makes me think about 
the countless brothers who asked to go to Medina, asked for letters of recommendation. What is Medina like? Tell me what it's like. Help me go, etc., etc. And just look now, what's going on in the world today? Who knows what will happen with COVID-19? Who knows will they uh, accept people from the United States or from the UK? Who knows? How many people will they take in? Who knows what's going to change? Who knows what type of new world order is going to come after this COVID-19 pandemic uh, subsides? If it subsides and the people open up their borders, open up their states, who knows? Things may get even worse. They may open up the borders, open up the cities, open up the city, and then what? Another outbreak. And they'll say, we see, we told you, stay in your homes, practice social distancing, you can't go out anymore. And they force the vaccine. Who knows what's going to happen? But just think about how, how long you had the opportunity to go to Medina. And you made excuses. You made excuses and you were not resilient. You were not hungry. You were not thirsty. And we know that these things, they don't always last. So go if you have the ability to go to study, wherever it may be, be resilient. When you hear of Faida, he said, write it down, even if it's on the wall. Even if it's on the wall. Moving forward. حدثنا أبو خيثمة قال حدثنا وكي قال حدثنا أبي عن عبد الله بن حنش قال لقد رأيتهم يكتبون على أكفهم بالقصب عند البراء أو عند البراء عبد الله بن حنش he says that I saw them meaning the salaf the earlier salaf I saw them sitting with البراء ابن عازب رضي الله تعالى عنه and they wrote things down with Pieces of wood on their hands. They wrote things down with wooden quills. Okay, reed, reeds, thin pieces of wood, hollow pieces of wood. They wrote things down, whatever they had to write, however they had to write on their hands, because of the fawad they were getting, like the previous ather. So we understand and we benefit from the way of the salaf, it's to write down knowledge. From the way of the salaf, it's to be hungry and to be resilient. And not to be prideful or conceited. And not to be relaxed when it comes to ilm. I'll get it later. I'll listen to it later. I'll watch it later. Oh, that's so la. That's not the attitude of the disciple. The disciple has to be hungry. The disciple has to realize that many things in life only come once. If you squander the opportunity, if you blow the opportunity, in most cases you will not get it back. You're 18. You're 19. You're 20. Take advantage of your youth now. Going to school, you can do that when you're 50. There's no age for college. You can get married later. You can get a job later. If your father or mother, if they're angry with you, they'll, they'll get over it. Big deal. They'll get over it. My son didn't go to law school. My son didn't be an engineer like I wanted to. He'll get over it. The knowledge, you can't get back again. You won't get the opportunity to go again, to sit with that person again. You never know. You may never ever see this person again. You may never have another halakha with him again. Be mindful. Be hungry, be resilient, and do not become complacent when it comes to talabul ilm. That's the message, guys. Khairan, inshaAllah ta'ala. Moving forward. Hadathana Abu Khaythima, qal hadathana wakiya, an ikrimata bin Ammar, an ikhbi nabi kathir, an ibn Abbas, an unqala qayyudu al-ilm bil kitab. Man yashtari minni ilman bidirham. Abu Khaythima narrates in Athar number 148 from uh, Wakiya from Ikrima ibn Ammar from Yahya ibn Kathir who said that Abdullah ibn Abbas said write down knowledge record knowledge script knowledge he said men yesterday who will buy knowledge from me for one dirham one silver coin one shilling who will purchase knowledge from me for a dollar basically Allahu Akbar this goes to show us once again the recommendation to write down knowledge and number two it also goes to show is that there are certain things of knowledge which can be purchased and can be bought. And this athar, it breaks the backs of those who say anyone who's paid to speak or to be a lecturer is not Salafi. And they're deviant. Ah, we have even some fools who say the proof that a person is a deviant is that he has a GoFundMe page, a Patreon page. That's the delil that this person is off of the Quran and Sunnah and that they're, they're going to the hellfire and Allah's anger with them. SubhanAllah. How he goes so far, so fast. Abdullah ibn Abbas says, Men yeshtedi, who will buy it from me for one dirham? A dirham, you pay for knowledge. Paper isn't free, ink isn't free. Time, energy, effort isn't free. Has to be compensated for. So the concept of knowledge and money never ever mixing is not correct. 
a person selling his deen for ilm, a person selling out, watering down knowledge, twisting it, warping it, a person lying along his messenger for ilm, that's a different story versus a person being compensated for their time and for their effort and for their energy, for their expertise versus a person freeing him or herself for ilm and for teaching. It's a difference. And as we said before, those brothers and sisters who talk like that and think like that are very hypocritical, extremely hypocritical. And that's because their sheikhs and the people that they quote from are paid for their services. Sheikh Fulan in his camp gets paid. Sheikh Fulan here gets paid. He has four wives. He has a, 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 a tribe of children. How do you think he's eating and surviving and living? He sells his books in other countries. He's getting paid. Sheikh Fulan that you quote from from overseas... In this country, he's a doctor in this university. He's getting paid top-notch money. He's getting benefits, retirement. So the people are there so hypocritical. In the UK, wherever you live, this brother that you're quoting from, who first and foremost is a jahil, he never studied nowhere, he never went overseas, he never benefited properly, okay? He gets paid. He has money. He's taking all the money from you. You're working and gaining the money for him. And then you attack someone who's far more knowledgeable than him, and they say, oh, Oh, he gets compensated, he takes an honorarium for his classes, so therefore he's a deviant. Yeah, I need the hypocrisy is so ugly and it stinks so so badly, it's just a horrible stench. Start with yourselves. You talking about people taking money and selling themselves. Begin with Ibda Obi and Fusikum. Start with yourselves. Your scholars, your teachers, and your daddies, and show us the transparency of the paper of trail, the money, all the donations, the tax exempt, your website, your publications is exempt from taxes. Show us where all the money is going. Show us the charity box. Show us all the donations where they go when you want to attack others. When you want to attack others. So therefore, a person being paid and being compensated, and of course you can never be paid for knowledge. It's never no price that someone can give you for ilm. The Quran and hadith, the wisdom that you give them. But you're being compensated for your time, for your efforts, and for your energy. And the people who say, well, Brother Fulan, he doesn't take an honorarium. Brother Fulan, he, he's not paid for this. Brother Fulan, we booked him. Okay, that's Brother Fulan. That's his opinion. That's his choice. Allah alam, how and where he makes his money from. Do you think Brother Fulan is poor? You think Brother Fulan doesn't have more than one wife? You don't think Brother Fulan has children? You don't think Brother Fulan has expenses? Are you that naive? Where do you think the money comes from? It comes from somewhere. Somewhere, somehow, he's getting paid. So the people need to be mindful of this. And of course, the imagination of an imam or a scholar or a student of knowledge that's going to be available, that's going to serve the people, that's going to be there for the people, that's going to have the time to read, to memorize, to research, to review, to prepare, to answer the people's questions. He's just going to live, you know, the rain is just going to fall on him and he's going to eat and drink. And that's an imagination. That's not true. That's not real. For a person to be free and for a person to be available, they have to be taken care of. May Allah Azza guide us all and open up our minds to the Quran, to the Sunnah, and to common sense.